Good morning, Samara. Today's date, the 22nd, 29th rather, of September 2020. Happy birthday to our dear brother, your uncle, Dr. Sam Christian, whose efforts in the 1980s, when he came to Howard University Medical School, opened the door for myself to come to Washington to study after running into the roadblock of political victimization that was meted out to many of those of my generation who were on the political left in the struggle for independence from Britain. But in this moment, in this room, I remember the presence and the spirit I feel of our brother, Rusey Douglas, who was then Prime Minister, who came here in May of 2000 in preparation for his speech at Georgetown in September of, 20, of, 20, of 2000, and also to meet with different people like Chapin Wilson and Roy Morgan, who had worked with our law firm to put together the University of New Orleans partnership in March of 2000, where he came to New Orleans with Reginald Osprey, his Minister of State, Matt Pelletier and Collagen Baptist, two independent Dominican journalists with whom he was very close, and Felix Augustine of the Government Information Service. Ruzi's focus in those early days of his administration was to unite the Dominican diaspora for development at home. It was to focus leadership in an honest, effective, and transparent way, with integrity being sort of the fuel for industry and agriculture and education partnerships, in particular with regard to ecotourism, that would be the University of New Orleans, but also information technology, as you would fashion, he would hope, with York University in Canada, Middlesex in England. Rusey had gone to Canada in the 1960s, in 1961 to be exact, to study agriculture at Guelph University. He later did his political science degree, master's, I believe, at McGill. So Yuzi was a very educated gentleman and someone who really focused us on education, how we could use science and technology to transform a colonial economy where we simply exported raw material to Britain into one where we could do value adding to our product, using the education of our people at home and abroad in partnership to advance uh, science and technology, build up our infrastructure, really build up institutions of higher learning, and use that success or progress and prosperity in Dominica to partner with Africans, African Americans, Africans all over the globe, and Africa. Because Ruzi was a Pan-Africanist. Well, not only was he a socialist, not only was he someone who believed in black power in a way not of anti-white prejudice, but all human beings respecting Africans who had been enslaved, who had been colonized as human beings, as Dr. King said, worthy of equality. We had been deemed subhuman. We had been deemed second-class citizens in our own country, here in the United States, in the Caribbean, in Africa even. That's why you had the racial, uh, super, the, the racist, uh, white supremacist doctrine of apartheid in South Africa. Ruzi struggled against that by working with uh, the Libyan government and the World Metaba to aid the African National Congress and the Southwest Africa People's Organization and the guerrilla armies to fight South Africa in Namibia and in South Africa. Itself. And I've met South African uh, guerrilla fighters. We had General Mandela right here in this room who spoke of Ruzi's help in the camps and help, his help in way of getting resources from Libya to arm them and to feed them and to clothe them so that the Dominican from a small island, a small English speaking island, could go to Canada, do agriculture, go to McGill, which is supposedly the best school in Canada, lead an uprising in 1968 at the Sir George William University for students' rights and for black pride and against racism to unite with indigenous Canadians, the Canadian Indian uh, movement, and to be a leader in bringing the Canadian Indians and black people together for civil rights, for human rights, to return to Dominica to unite students and farmers and youth to struggle for independence successfully, which we gained in 1978, to after 20 years of struggle and political struggle in the wilderness, become prime minister, and at the height of his leadership, be cut down. We believe, many of us, that Ruzi was killed. We believe Ruzi was killed. Uh, we believe that there are those who did not want Ruzi's vision of uniting Africans at home and abroad in beneficial endeavor to live. And for those who killed Ruzi, they may have killed him in the flesh, but his spirit is ever living, and his spirit shall rise again. And all of us who remember his work on earth and who struggled uh, with him and who walked with him to build uh, 
better societies in the Caribbean, in Africa, in North America, Ruzi indeed will never die. He was a deeply Christian man, came from a deeply Christian family, a family that was given to charity and charitable works, a family that was prosperous, but yet very humble. Ruzi was a very humble person. And I tell a story. So when we came to New Orleans, Ruzi had a pair of shoes, and I'd known Ruzi from the age of 15 when he met me in 1976 at the Dunker Grammar School, and I became a member of the Popular Independence Committee that he formed there with people like Irvin Andre, Lloyd Pascal, meeting at the home of Hilarion Deja, Gordon Warrington, your uncle, Albert Bellart, Steve John, folks from Portsmouth Secondary School like Romus Lamoff, Debbie Douglas, of course Pierre Charles, brothers like Jamala, Master Jamala Fontaine, even Paul Alexander, Greg Thomas, Tony Blairs, all these brothers working together. Richard Green from the SMA who we met at 6-4, people like Dexter Francis, Ricky Alport, all of us working together to better Dominica. Ruzi focused us on education. He never cared about his pocket. He never cared about money and wealth and policies on the hill. He was a humble man. So I met him at the concourse between two secret service agents. On the morning he came to New Orleans in March of 2000. He had a bag in his hand, a little plastic bag. I said, Ruzi, you're Prime Minister. What do you do with that little bag? Give it to me. I took it away from him. He laughed. He smiled. I saw a pair of shoes on his feet. They were decent shoes, but they didn't look Prime Ministerial. So I took him to Jose Banks. What a tie and blazer. This is my older brother, Ruzi Douglas, now Prime Minister. I'm so proud of him. And we're walking down the street and new pair of shoes and all. That was our brother. That was our friend. That was our leader. We loved him. That was in March. So when Ruzi came here to this very home, sitting here in 2000, Mar May, I saw the older shoes. I say, well, Brother Ruzi, where are the shoes I bought you in New Orleans? Ruzi looked at me and smiled and said, Gabe, you know I'm an old cadet. I tried to shine these shoes, but they just couldn't take any shine. So I gave them away. Ruzi gave them away. It later turned out to someone who didn't have a proper pair of shoes. He was going to get married and didn't have a proper pair of shoes and he gave it to him. And it reminded me that when I was about to, about to embark on the, 11th, on the trip to the 11th World Festival of Youth and Students in July 1978, I had a pair of suede boots, brown suede boots. I was attending the Dominica Grammar School, or I had left the grammar school, I was in the first year at sixth form, and I had hit a stone and it opened the front of it. I didn't have time to go to the shoemaker. Ruzi had just gotten back from Canada a few years before and had a lot of Canadian clothing, I guess. And he had a nice, solid pair of boots by Clarks. Clarks uh, is a very famous British shoe company that is very popular, was very popular back in the day. And he went to his Ford one, uh, F-150 pickup truck. And he took from the truck a pair of those Clarks boots. And he said, he called me Gable, put those boots on. When you get to Cuba and you get your shoes fixed, Give them to Steve John. His shoes are worse than yours. And, you know, at the moment in New Orleans when we went to the store and bought them that outfit, I never remembered that. But deep down in the recesses of my mind, I was familiar with the generosity of spirit that possessed Ruthie Douglas at all times, where he always put others before himself. And I'll give you a final little story about Ruthie Douglas and New Orleans, where we signed a protocol to create in Dominica a world-class Eco-Tourism Science Training Institute in partnership with the University of New Orleans. That was Ruzi's vision, to partner Dominicans at home and abroad through their relationships with universities and science and technology companies to boost Dominica's fortune. So we could move away from being a producer of citrus and bananas to being a high-tech nation fit and able to navigate the shores of the modern information technology-driven economy. Ruzi had that vision. But Ruzi was very modest in the pursuit of that vision. So here we are at the hotel in the French Quarter, and they're charging, or the Foreign Affairs Office has arranged for three suites at 750 US a night. And Ruzi is upset, he's angry, he says, Gabe, look, our bananas aren't selling, our people are struggling, we can't pay 750 US dollars, and of course it's $2.70 EC to one US dollar, so multiply that by 2.70, we're talking almost $1,500. Per night. So he said, he said, Gabriel, you take care of that. 
So he stepped back with Reginald Austri, Felix Augustine, Matt Pelty, and Kalai John Baptist. And I said, well, gee, you know, uh, I'd organized this whole trip with the university, but I'd not organized the rooms. That had been done by foreign affairs in Rosa Dominica, Dominica's capital. So I went up to the concierge and I put on my first, my best lawyer's voice. And I said, uh, I'm the uh, attorney to the Prime Minister of Dominica, and we're here on this visit. And of course, the room rates are not what we're quoted. I think there's a problem here, and we need to get this done, this, that, and the other. 375. I gave up two of the suites. We took one suite, reduced to 375. And when I looked back, Rusey had his hand on his head. I thought I had done well. But Rusey was a joker as well. He had a very deep sense of humor. He said to the guys, got it. You know, look, these people are charging us $750 a night for three suites. But when I heard the way that Gabe was talking, what is he going to charge us? The way that he's talking, I don't think we can afford him as a lawyer. <laughs> Everybody started laughing. And that is how Rusey was. And we went up to the suites, or the suite rather, because he'd given the tour the way. And in that suite, there were, I think, two king beds or something like that, or two queen beds in the, you know, kitchenette and, you know, uh, waiting area, foyer, and so on. Rusey gave the beds. He said, you guys sort yourselves out. That is, two to a bed. Reginald Austria and Matt Peltier to one bed, Kalai John Baptist and Felix Augustine to another bed, and Rusey, I left him sleeping at a bad angle on the couch. Just pan your, the camera to this couch. A couch like this at the university, at the, um, the, the I think it's a Hilton in, in, in the French Quarter. Rusey had his head at a bad angle on the arm of the couch, or the sofa, and was snoring. I noticed that the year before he passed away, he was snoring heavily. He would fall asleep quickly, and I gently took his head, and I put a cushion beneath his head, and I left him, and I went to the university where I was sleeping, because I got a room for like $25, you know, student quarters, a uh, very cheap, uh, you know, rate until the evening when there was a reception with the mayor and the president, Gregory O'Brien, and everything else. So that was Rusey. That was Rusey Douglas. So today, we remember him. He died suddenly on the 1st October, 2000. Rusey's last conversation was about partnership with Georgetown University and other U.S. universities, partnership with the U.S. government and the diaspora, so we could work together hand in hand, not on the basis of partisanship and politics, but on the basis of sincere effort at national development to build Dominica, and then to take that model across the Caribbean and across the African diaspora to do the same thing for Africa. That was his vision. And in pursuit of that vision, Rusey had been invited to be the keynote speaker on the fifth anniversary of the Million Man March. There would be a Million Family March on the Mall in Washington. And he said to me he was going to make an appeal to all African Americans and others of goodwill, to partner with Dominica. So instead of selling pa passports, we'll be promoting partnership in development. So when we left Georgetown in the limousine provided us by the university, there was Mr. Knight from Portsmouth, uh, Jean-Pierre, the former mayor, super dude of Portsmouth, and Claudette LeBlanc. And Rusey gave us two jokes. I'll never forget. We're driving down M Street, I think, in Georgetown, and he saw a woman next to a uh, club, and he said, she had a very low pants. He said, in college, we called it the low rider, and we all laughed. And he said, when he was in Canada, he went and he lived in an apartment. So he sent a postcard, a picture of himself in front of the apartment, with his hands on his side to his father, and he said, dear dad, my home. So when his father, who was very frugal, uh, Robert Douglas, got the picture with Rusey in front of this big apartment, he sent a note to Rusey saying, Dear Rusey, because you know he's trying to watch his pennies, send his son to Canada. Of all the houses in Canada that they're there to be rented, why did you have to get such a big house? He didn't understand. Rusey was staying only just one apartment. He wasn't staying in the entire facility. Then he said later, he sent a, ca a, a cable when money was running short to his father. There were no in emails then. It says, Dear Dad, no, and you, in, in the days of cable, you had to count your letters. More letters, more money, right? So he said, Dear Dad, no man, meaning money, no fun, your son. And when his father got it, he said, his father wrote back a cable. 
Dear son, so sad, too bad, your dad. <laughs> <laughs> so Rusi gave us jokes that night. I never knew then. That was the last night, that was the last time I would be with him. We got to the hotel, across Chain Bridge at the Chain, Chain Bridge Marriott. Interestingly, the same Marriott where your mom and I were the night before the election of, John, of, of Donald Trump, where I spoke for the students of the Americas. And he said, here's my son Cabral, you've never met him. Cabral, that's a Gabriel Christian always told you about, speak with him. I'm going in to talk to the organizers of the Million Family March from the Nation of Islam. Ruzi was very close to Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam. And he had appointed Akbar Muhammad of the Nation of Islam as Dominica's International Emissary for Development. I'll see you a little bit. He walked into the hotel. I never saw Ruzi alive again. I spoke to Cabral for a few minutes, but I've been with Ruzi all day. We've been to the Qatar Embassy. We've been to different places. We've been to Hogan and Hudson, which represented the Ross University Medical School. He was working to help build up Ross in Portsmouth, which was a very major economic development driver for Dominica. And we had had a long day. I had caught the next morning. I had not seen your mom and yourself and McConan all day. I told Cabral, tell dad, tell Uncle Ruzi, you know, tell your dad I'll see him. I'll call him tomorrow. And Ruzi called me. He said, Gabe, it's a very great meeting we had last night at Georgetown. Called Greg Rabess and so on. And the other guys, I think, Matt Peltier. And let them know what we're doing. Take care. That was Ruzi's last voicemail, which I preserved for many years. And it's somewhere on a tape somewhere. In conclusion, as you remember Ruzi, 20 years later, Ruzi was a loving man. He was a modest man. He was a fighter for freedom, not just of black people, but of all people. On the night before he was buried, on the stage were people from Africa, Latin America, the Middle East. I'll never forget, one of the people who spoke at Ruzi's funeral was from the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. He was a member of Sinn Féin, the Irish nationalists who were fighting for the independence of Northern Ireland. Rusey had helped because of his links to the British Labour Party and to Tony Blair to bring the Sinn Féin, the British government together in peace talks. Because Rusey had worked with Irish people in Canada, he had worked with Sinn Féin, he was a common fixture at their meetings. A young man from Dominica who had gone to Canada in 1961 to study agriculture at Guelph University, gone on to McGill in Montreal, led the student uprising at Sir George William University against racism in education, worked to build relationships with Canadian indigenous people, the First Nations, and Africans in Canada, and West Indians in Canada, who had helped the African National Congress and the Southwest African People's National, Southwest Africa People's Organization, SWAPO, ANC, in, South Africa, SWAPO in Namibia, to fight for the freedom against the apartheid regime, which supplied freedom fighters with weapons through World Mataba in Libya. General Mandela was in this room, the military attaché of the South African embassy, and confirmed this, what Ruzi had done to help African freedom. So our Ruzi was taken away from us. There are many of us who believe that Ruzi was the victim of an assassination, it could be he may have died of natural causes. We may never really fully know. But we know that there is a long history of those who resist African freedom and who have always tried to stop the rise of a black messiah, be it Marcus Garvey or Malcolm X, to either derail, snuff out, liquidate, place obstacles in front of those leaders who have sought our betterment and the expansion of human freedom. But Ruzi Douglas, in my view, will be ever living because his example was not in palaces or in material things. His example was in the spirit of goodness, of love, of kindness, of peace among men and women, that the humble of the earth, the First Nations, the oppressed black people of the world, could unite with their white brothers and sisters of transcendental humanistic reaching to build a better civilization. So 20 years later, we remember Ruzi Douglas, who was supposed to have spoken at the Million Family March on October 16th, the fifth anniversary of the Million Man March as a keynote speaker. He never made that speech. His call would have been to unite 
Africans at home and abroad in beneficial endeavor. Though he's gone, may his soul, like that of John Brown of Happers Ferry, who fought for freedom, a white man, may he and John Brown up in the heavens be in perfect union as both their souls were marching on. Thank you, Sam, for listening.